Hello. What I want to start with is just saying, hi, I'm Anne, and I'm um, from Children First and Parent Line. Um, and this is Suzanne that you can see here. We've been chatting already this morning. Just to give you a wee bit of background on myself, I work for Children First Parent Line, and we're a support line, and 365 days of the year, we're here for parents, carers, kinship carers, anyone who's just worried or needs a bit of advice about a child, we're here for them and we'll give you support, advice and we'll chat to you, whatever it is you're needing. And you can get, I mean, you can see behind me all the details, <laughs> which saves me giving it to you. And um, also you can go to the website, website, great source of information for strategies and information about how, how a child's brain works, all of that really good. I would really suggest it's worth a look. Um, and at the moment, especially because of lockdown and where we're at, kinship carers, you're in a, it's a very difficult job, but not a job you would ever not want to have. You love these kids and your kids, they're your kids, but for lots of reasons, it can be more difficult for you and more difficult for the children. So for that reason, we're really delighted that we've set up these conversations, these three conversations um, with the lovely Dr. Suzanne Zirek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to pass you over to Suzanne. She'll tell you a bit about herself. It's lovely to welcome everyone this morning. <clears throat> um, I'm really a research scientist and was at the University of Dundee for about 20 years before I took a decision, which was a big decision, to um, step away from that in order to try to help the public to understand what I call the science of connection, which is to understand why relationships matter so much and where we struggle and um, what, what has science discovered that can help us with all of that. And I absolutely love doing it. And in fact, today is a very special day for me. Um, today is my ninth birthday. We held the launch for that today, nine years ago. And so I've been um, celebrating that in my head that we were going to get to do this today as a way of marking that. So I think it's great. And I'm delighted that Parent Line, and we put all of this together as a way of supporting uh, kinship carers because there, some of the stories that have come in, some people are struggling with some really tough, scary stuff. I think that's right. And that, that's exactly what we were, want to talk about today, as well as laughter, which is such an important help and just a way of helping us all to cope in the more difficult situations we're in. Um, but what people are coping about, uh, with at the moment, Suzanne, is really hard. Anxiety is about their own health, given, yeah. given the world we're living in and the fear that people are yeah. holding on to when it, the fear of going to the supermarket. Yeah. You know, it, you're scared you're bringing something home. The fear that you have complex health issues and your children are going to bring those back in. And what happens if you do get ill? What, who's going to look after the kids? Yep, 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 yep. It, Huge anxieties. Uh, uh, the anxieties that we would never have expected, the anxieties that might have were hard to prepare for, and so um, how to address them in the moment when they come up, as well as how to plan for them. Yeah. Just talking about it and hearing ideas and hearing what other people are doing can be really helpful in times like that. that and yeah. so which is why we put to get today together. Yeah, I mean, the, the other things that people have talked to us about, and I know they've talked to my colleagues throughout Children First about is, you know, things like homeschooling. You know, how hard is it to te be the teacher as well as parent stroke carer? Yeah. Do you know, I am trying to get them to sit down and do the work when it's a lovely day outside or get them up in the morning when there isn't the routine of going to school. All of these things. And the stories coming back make it clear that some households have felt really supported by schools. And the yeah. truth is that it's just the truth is that other households haven't felt so supported by schools. So 
you might be able to step into those big challenges more easily if you're feeling really supported and not pressured by your school. Uh -huh. But if it feels more like you're doing it on your own, that will make those tasks even harder. Yeah. And, you know, what makes it different and more difficult for kinship carers is that they have the added stress and pressure from the birth family. Yeah. You know, so that could be your own son or daughter who wants to have connection and wants to still have contact through a time when you don't feel that safe. And how do you help the child understand that? But also, how do you manage the adults yeah. as well? Yeah. yeah, These are really difficult situations. And actually, yeah, you know, more than difficult is what I'm thinking. I can't imagine how difficult some of this sort of stuff is. It's so hard. Which is why I think it's really ironic that in this series of three conversations, we're going to start with laughter. And actually, <laughs> it's not ironic at all. When we talked about what topics we might cover, I absolutely wanted to cover laughter. And I wanted to start there because um, laughter feels like something that you could do, that everybody could do. It doesn't feel big and unmanageable. And yet it sounds kind of crazy that you want to talk about laughter when we're in the middle of some really serious situations. And the answer is yes, I do. Yeah. La laughter is remarkable help if we have faith that it's really appropriate and that it's really enough. And so that's my aim today is to help us to get more confident about laughter. Fantastic. And I know that um, we may get questions and I would invite, I, I can see the chats going on here at the side of us, which is fantastic. And I would invite, absolutely invite everybody throughout this. I know Suzanne and definitely myself would love to hear what you're thinking about what we're seeing, but also if there are any questions or anything's touched <coughs> yourself or touched a nerve for you, please, please share it and we'll try and where we can. I'm not saying I'm that great at multitasking and reading huge bits when I'm trying to talk. I'm not that brilliant at that, but I will. And if there is anything there, if we don't address it during our, our session, we'll go back. We won't leave you. We'll, we'll try and do that later, won't we, Suzanne? Absolutely. And in fact, Anne, I love, you've just demonstrated anxiety and kind of like, <laughs> but you have. And so I celebrate that, okay? So if you can feel anxious and you yeah. can demonstrate that anxiety and not be embarrassed about it or feel ashamed about it or feel like you have to hide it, yeah. that's exactly what we are talking about in all of this, is how do we live more authentically? How do we be present with whatever we're feeling? And how do we help our children to do that? So. I'm just grateful that you've said all of this is new to me, but I'm taking a risk and I'm going to give it a shot. And that's what all of this is about. I'm just glad you're here. So, that's, <laughs> that's <all. Well. laughs> so I think you're going to go and tell us a little bit more about laughter now, which I'm I am. really looking forward to. I am. So, okay, here's what we think we'll do for like the next 45 minutes or so in a second. I'm gonna put up some PowerPoint slides, mostly with photographs and pictures and images that can just help us to get our heads around why is it that laughter works? And then keep, come, keep your, um, the chat coming in and then we're gonna come back and just have a, series, a conversation between Anne and I continuing that, but drawing on whatever questions you might have and some of the questions that we've been sent already about some of the things that you're all struggling with during lockdown. So let's pull up. There we go. Let's, here are some thoughts I have pulled together that I hope are helpful to people. Okay, so what we're doing over the next three Thursdays is having some conversations with kinship carers. And today we're going to talk about laughter. And next week we're going to talk about organizing. And the week after that we're going to talk about listening. So the idea is that these are three things that you can do to help when times are really tough in your household. And we purposely made them simple and straightforward because sometimes you can think it has to be bigger than that. 
and it doesn't. Part of the point of all of this is that really simple things can make a real difference. And we gave those titles because of this. <laughs> because when you abbreviated them, it turned into LOL, it turned into laugh out loud. And I want these topics and these conversations to feel reassuring. And so we hope that abbreviation of LOL might give a sense of that. Now, you might be thinking, Suzanne, that sounds absolutely fine. That's a lovely picture of that, you know, of a granny and her granddaughter cuddling, laughter, organizing, listening makes sense for me. But are you telling me that laughter really applies? Because actually this image depicts an awful lot more of how I have felt during lockdown. If that's what you're thinking, that's cool by me. Because laughter still helps. And for those of you who haven't been pushed to the point where you're shouting, you might have spent a lot of your time during lockdown doing this. You might have spent time crying. And of course, you might have cycled through all three of those. All of that's okay. And I think laughing, organizing, and listening is relevant no matter what you're feeling and no matter what is happening for your family. Okay. So today, if we're gonna think about laughter, I thought we might talk about these three ideas. Why relationships matter. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of science around why your relationship with your child matters so much in ways that very often people who care for children don't realize. So that means that you take a lot of your skills and abilities for granted. Um, it's easy not to see them. And I want to help you to see them so that you then can step into them and realize there's a lot already that you're doing that's really working, even when sometimes you feel kind of overwhelmed and not certain. And then I want to talk a bit about why laughing helps. And then just think about some tips on how you can laugh more, even if times feel really tense right now. And just before we do that, I popped this in and I've already said now in our opening comments, I just wanted to celebrate today and to thank all of you who've been part of the journey with me. Um, today is the ninth anniversary of, the, of when I stepped away from the university and tried to step into the public. And I wanted to pause on that because there's nobody else that I will sell, share this day with. You guys are it. So thank you for being at, at kind of a party. Um, but it also helps us to think about how do you get this information? When I set that up, I didn't know if it would work. I didn't know if people would be interested in science. I didn't know if it would scare them. And nine years on, we're, I'm still here, my team is still here, and there's tons of people talking about this now. And I feel so grateful for that. And when we went to find that original invite that we sent to the launch events we had, I laughed because you can see all that all those fancy colored Lego-y looking things, that's an oxytocin mod module. That's what the hormone oxytocin looks like. And ironically, I'm gonna come back to that and it was already in my slides. So it's interesting to think that oxytocin is one of the themes which we're talking about today, but which has been part of the conversation for the last nine years. So thank you. I saw in the chat that some are already saying happy birthday. Thank you for that. Okay, so let's come back to why do relationships matter? What are you already doing that's brilliant that you might not even know? Okay, where do you start with that? This is where I always start. And I think it's always worth coming back here, even if it feels like you already know it. Babies arrive already connected to other people. And it is from that that everything else comes. Everything else I'm talking about, the struggles that you're having, the successes that you're having, the feelings that you're having, the disconnections, it comes from the fact that human beings are wired to pay attention to other people. In our brains and our bodies, we orient to other people and therefore to relationships. This is Daniel and his mom, Kelly. And Daniel was born during lockdown. 
And this is a picture of he and his mom at 30 minutes old. And if you can see the strong connection that's already there between he and his mom, he came wired for that. We didn't used to know that. Science used to think that babies couldn't even see at that age, and now we know they can. They might not be able to see across the room, but they can absolutely see that distance when you're cradling in the arms. Baby can see mom, mom, mom can see the baby. But sometimes we'll miss that capacity if the baby's struggling, if labor was hard, maybe mom is coming off of, or the baby is withdrawing from drugs maybe that mom has ingested. So sometimes we can't see the connection, but as long as the context is right, and people and that everybody involved isn't um, you know struggling you can see the connection that human beings come with they're born with they're pre-wired for that baby will have known his mom's voice from before the time he was born in the womb he could hear kelly's voice and therefore he knows whether she sings a lot and she laughs a lot or whether she shouts and cries a lot and already his brain will have been wired for expectations about what other people are gonna be like and what it feels like to be with them. And the reason I always start here is because actually that one understanding that babies come wired for connection and that that's gonna shape their later biological, their you know, how they develop after that, how their brains develop, how their bodies develop, it begins to make sense why they struggle with some of the things they do and why we carry our childhoods into our futures. And one of the tricky things about kinship families is that they're dealing not only with the history of their child, they're dealing with the history of their family. And so that makes this insight even more powerful because it highlights some of that complexity. Okay, so then here's what happens. That connection that we just talked about goes on to shape your whole biological development. It shapes how your brain's development and how your bodies develop. And I talk about that, as some of you know, as saber-toothed tigers and teddy bears. Okay, so the scary moments that we have, the uncomfortable moments that we have, I call saber tooth tiger moments because it captures the feel of how scary and hard they are. And our body goes into a stress state in order to cope with them when we're sad, when we're scared, when we're uncertain, when we have to learn a new Zoom technology and we don't know which button to push, when we're scared that our grandma's gonna die of COVID, when we're feeling guilty because our children aren't with us and they're with our mother. When we're anxious about where did we put our mask before we go out to the shop. When we're angry at our grandmother because she said that we can't have any chocolate. All of those are saber tooth tiger moments. And our body goes into a stress state just as we would need if we were literally running away from danger. And we also have this other system in our body called the teddy bear system, which helps us to feel calm and relaxed and safe and healthy development means that people can go back and forth between those two states. But that isn't what happens for everybody. Some people get really wired to be much more in a saber tooth tiger state. And for lots of children in kinship care, as well as foster care, who have had experiences of lots of fear in their life, even the early life, sometimes even in the womb, they get wired to be in a saber-toothed tiger state and that makes them harder to live with. So understanding this really simple information lets us be curious about what's happening rather than quite so frustrated. So let me unpack that a teeny bit, go back to brains. So what that means is if, it, if you have lots of saber-toothed tiger moments, you get lots of saber-toothed tiger pathways in your head you get lot you get your brain gets wired for anxiety and for being on the lookout for the arrival of danger similarly if you have lots of wiring in your brain if you have lots of experience of calming and reassuring and safety you get lots of those pathways in your brain 
So for all the struggling kinship carers out there, what that tells you is that many of your children have lots of wiring for saber-toothed tigers in their brains, and everything you can do to help them to have moments of safety will help to rewire that brain. You are literally building neural pathways in their head with everything you do. And I mean this to be reassuring because we often worry, especially if when behavior is difficult, we worry that we're not doing enough. We're worrying that change isn't happening quickly enough. We're worrying that we can't change it. You can change it. It doesn't always happen quickly. And I know there are many, many frustrating moments. But if you just take trust in this idea that the more neural, the more experiences of safety that you can provide your children, they are building neural pathways that help them to calm and feel reassured. I love knowing that because it feels like a relief. And then we can make that even bigger. It's also the body. So here's the saber tooth tiger and the teddy bear systems. They have fancy names. So, um, you know, people who do um, anatomy and who, uh, bi you know, biologists who talk about the body will use those fancy names there at the top, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. But who can remember those words? Those words are not accessible for most people. That's why I call them the saber tooth tiger and the teddy bear system. And what we're trying to do is go back and forth between those two systems. That's effectively what makes up the stress system. All of us need to be able to have a saber tooth tiger system or we would be able to take risks. We wouldn't be able to try new things. Anne would not be here today if she didn't have a saber tooth tiger system to help her to take that risk. But if she stays in that state all day long, she won't be able to calm down and she won't be able to have a relaxed conversation with me. She needs to be able to get back to her teddy bear system. We could call those two parts of the stress system. Um, we could call it the self-regulatory system. Now that's a big word. If you like big words, here's a new one you can take away. If you don't like big words, ignore it. But I'm just trying to help us to think about different ways that we can characterize what I just said. Here are different ways to talk about the way these two parts of the body work together. The stress system, the self-regulatory system, i.e. the system that helps you to manage how you feel. Lots of your children will struggle with that. Their self-regulatory system will be fragile. They go into a saber-toothed tiger state really quickly and it's harder for them to get back to their teddy bear state. They need your help to do that. And sometimes helping them to do that becomes hard for you. Really frustrating for you, scary for you. And you stay in a saber-toothed tiger state and you start to shout or you start to cry or you feel overwhelmed. All of that is normal and understandable. That's how human bodies are built. And if I just say that, what I hope it does is bring relief because you can think, okay, this is normal. This is what bodies are meant to do, even when it's uncomfortable. And that's what underpins behavior. Behavior from children when they're in an to emotional tornado is, can be very hard to cope with. It can be scary. I know that we've had a, um, some questions that have come in um, of kinship carers who are scared of their grandchildren because their grandchildren have threatened violence. Uh, maybe even violence while they're sleeping. That's scary. We might come back to that. That means that that child who is threatening violence is in their saber-toothed tiger state. And they're coping. It's a really big whirlwind. So they're coping with it through threatening violence. Putting that frame on it, I hope, takes away some of the fear. And then that lets us think more um, creatively about how to help a family that is in that level of distress. And so that's an extreme version. Let me think of another one. Um, you might have a child. In fact, there's another question that's come in. What, what do I do about the child who has locked himself in a room and will not come out even to eat meals? He's really, you know, slammed the door. He too 
is in a saber-toothed tiger state. And so if you can just label those difficult moments, okay, this is a saber-toothed tiger state, it helps to start to give you a new way of making sense of it. And all of those experiences we now know have a contribution to adult mental health and to adult physical health. And so that helps you to realize the power and the importance of every single time you can create a teddy bear state and laughter is great for that. But just before I say that, let me add a couple more things. Um, I know some of you will have followed you know, my work already and you know about the book Saber Two Tigers and Teddy Bears, but some of you out there might not know. So that's just a, me flashing a picture of the cover of the book that we launched during lockdown. We've done a second edition of that book, and it's just meant to give you a sense of how that language works. And so if you're really curious, that gives you another resource that you could turn to. And one of the things that that book talks about is the history of childhood trauma. And almost all of the children who are in kinship care will carry a history of trauma where they wouldn't need to be in kinship care. And the word trauma can feel big and scary. In fact, some people feel judged and blamed by it. So I'm saying it out loud so that it takes away some of those feelings. Childhood trauma means children have experienced lots of saber-toothed tiger moments. They have experienced lots of fear and that that is likely to have changed their brain and their body. And when we understand that, it helps us to have more compassion and a bit more patience. Now, maybe I'm saying something that lots of you already know. If you already know and you've got that in your soul, well done, because not everybody gets it. For others of you, that may be a new idea, and therefore it's worth putting it out there. What happens in childhood doesn't always stay in childhood. You can carry it with you to your adult life. And kinship carers have a more complicated experience of this than I think any other family. Because as I said earlier, you're not just caring for the child who's carrying whatever they're carrying. It's part of your family where the child would have ended up in kinship care. So you've got multiple levels of this idea. So any contemplation you can do of it, you're doing well. And I hope you congratulate yourself because there will also be lots of other moments where it's really difficult to feel what this knowledge is like for your family. Okay, and if you're thinking, okay, when do we talk about the laughter? And are you really serious that laughter goes together with this? Suzanne, that feels too different. Well, I'm not the only one talking about it. Here's a piece from 2019 before we all went into lockdown in which there are people training as clowns specifically with the vision of bringing foster families together. They are specifically thinking about how to use laughter to cope with exactly the kinds of situations that I've just been highlighting. So I'm not the only one talking about this. And I hope seeing that lovely picture help gets us more curious. And in fact, this is what part of this article says, that play is a really safe, fun way to build relationships and connection because connection leads to healing. And I think that that's what we are talking about when we talk about laughter. So let me, with all of that, that background that I just covered tells us the why of this, right? Why it's important that we think about laughter or any other ways of connecting. So let me just give you a little bit of the science of laughter. <clears throat> Okay, I'm just gonna to touch on some tidbits of things that I love. Why do we laugh as human beings? What, where does that come from? Well, in a second, I'm gonna talk about play. And one of the things we think is that laughter is part of play for mammals, but I don't wanna start there. I wanna start here. Because there are some evolutionary scientists who say that laughter is also a way of celebrating safety. It's a moment of relief. It's when you giggle because the danger has passed, because the saber-toothed tiger has run past your village and we are all now safe together. That means that to the body, laughter is signaling safety. 
So it can sound light and silly to us and to the body. It says you're still alive and you're still thriving. You're still surviving. And so when I come to talk about laughter in really serious situations, like your child has locked themselves in the room and has not come out to eat for a week, like a child who is threatening violence, when you think, okay, laughter will really help to create a sense of safety in that child's body and in my body and in my connection with them, suddenly laughter starts to sound much more serious and powerful. So that's one thing to know about laughter is that many evolutionary scientists think that part of its origin is that it comes out of a sense of relief. And the other thing that scientists now think it comes out of is a sense of play. All mammals play and lots of mammals laugh in a version of what their throat allows. But the interesting thing about play is that you never know what is going to happen. Play is always a step into the unknown. You don't know what your friend playing with you will offer. You don't know what they will say. You don't know what adventure you will go on. The whole point of play is that it is creative and unknown. And that sounds really easy when I say it that way. Except the unknown is also scary. The unknown is where the tigers lie. The unknown in the village, you know, at the edge of the village, that's where the tigers could be waiting for you. So for many people, the unknown is scary. And in fact, in all of our lives, I think the unknown is sometimes scary. The reason Anne was worried a minute ago is because she wasn't sure she could work the technology. She's had to take a step into uncertainty. And if it was too scary for her, she wouldn't be able to. So trusting that the unknown will not bring pain is actually a real gift. And for many of the children that you're with, it's too much. Uncertainty and, un and the unknown is too scary. So when you want them to try something new, or you want them to try talking to you about their feelings, or you want them to do conflict with you, it's too scary. It takes trust. And trust is exactly what is hard for them. So whatever you can do to play, whatever you can do to bring laughter to your interactions is a form of play. And that helps them to develop a little bit more of trust. And trust is really hard for them. So both of those elements, the, the sense of safety and play and therefore trusting the unknown are part of why scientists now think laughter is helpful for human relationships. And here, part is, here is part of how it does that. So what it does is it relaxes the muscles. When you start to laugh, it relaxes the muscles in your rib cage. It takes away the tension in your shoulders. It lets you breathe more deeply. <clears throat> Literally laughing, it, it like relaxes the body. You don't have to set out to do yoga to relax your body. You can just have more laughter in your house. It fights infection. So it boosts the immune system. It keeps you from getting so ill. And in fact, here's a lot of other things that it does in this little image. It relaxes muscles, improves concentration. It increases breathing. It energizes you, enhances your memory. It's actually a really great health technique if you want to call it that, but that makes it sound boring. It doesn't sound like laughter anymore. Laughter sounds fun. That's the point. The fun is having all these other benefits. Okay, and now we're back to oxytocin, which I highlighted a minute ago. Laughter produces hormones that flood through your body. Um, and one of those is oxytocin. And oxytocin is the teddy bear hormone. It helps you to feel safe. It helps you to feel relaxed. I think there's something remarkable about thinking that laughter actually changes you biologically. It changes the hormones that your body is producing. 
And if you have enough laughter in your childhood, it wires you to produce those hormones more rapidly and more easily. So when you help your children to laugh, you are changing their biology for the long term, not just for the behavioral incident that you set out to change, which is really important to change and it will make your life easier. In other words, it lasts beyond that moment. <clears throat> it lasts into their future. Okay, here's a couple of other things. There's now more and more people talking about how laughter helps to resolve conflict in families and in couples. Because it turns out that what couples do is they co-regulate their emotions. So they feed off of each other. And so if you've got somebody in the household <clears throat> who's good at laughing, it helps just by, just by being in the same room in the same household, it, they co-regulate emotions, which just means you do it together, but you do it spontaneously and unconsciously. That we now know that couples who laugh together are more likely to stay together. You know, it kind of goes back to that old romantic adage, you know, find somebody who makes you laugh. Well, there's a science to that now. Okay, if we get that, it also means that if you've got somebody in the house who's not good at laughing, that means that, they, that people will co-regulate in the same way. If you are struggling to laugh, it means it will be harder for your children to laugh too. I do not mean that as pressure. I know you can't laugh all the time. I'm not pressuring you into laughing um, inauthentically. I'm just saying that wherever you can laugh and wherever you can bring lightness to a moment, that will help to co-regulate your children's feelings too. And if you want more on the science of laughter, because I've just touched on a few tidbits, there's this great video from Sophie Scott, which is a whole TED talk on the science of laughter. And there will be downloadable resources from Children First website, which tell you where you can go for more information. And this is one of the videos that I've suggested if you're interested to learn some more. You can just put that on and while you're chopping up vegetables or getting dressed or, 20 minutes later, you'll know quite a little bit more about laughter. Okay, so keeping an eye on the time so that we've got time for some conversation. <laughs> let me just give you a couple of few ideas about how you can laugh more in your family. I'm just gonna drip these through. Okay, you can find more things to giggle about. Here's a great granny, and this will be in the resources as well. You can go and have a look at the Scottish granny who is giggling over something as simple as a book she's reading with her baby. You can make sure that you laugh out loud. Sometimes we laugh, but we do it very quietly. Don't do it quietly. Laugh out loud so that the folks in your house can hear it, and that helps with that co-regulation. Here's another one. Create moments of laughter. So make a ritual of laughter. Every time you sit down at the kitchen table or in your dining room to have a meal, bring a joke, right? Get the children to bring a joke every day. So here's one. Why did grandma put wheels on a rocking chair? Because she wanted to rock and roll. They're silly jokes, but they make a ritual out of laughter and then people spend the day preparing for the laughter you're gonna have at the end of the day. You could try laughter yoga. Now for some of you, you'll go, are you nuts? I'm not going anywhere near that crazy sounding thing. Except Oprah Winfrey recommends laughter yoga. And she's done a whole lot on mental health. And indeed, Philip and Holly tried out laughter yoga on this morning just last year. So laughter yoga is meant to find ways to help us to laugh. And so if you are up for feeling a bit silly, here's a really simple way you can Google for it in lockdown. Okay, here's one idea. Be sure that you're laughing with and not at. That is the crucial, crucial way in which laughter works. When you're laughing with somebody and not turning them into an object, not turning them at, get something to be laughed at. We know what it's like to, be, to feel humiliated. And in fact, it's really interesting to think that the reason being laughed at feels humiliating is precisely because 
you're not in connection, but you're in derision. So using laughter with is what makes it really powerful. You can even make the scary stuff fun. So we're all being encouraged our masks. That's scary for a lot of people. I love this mask and I'm not talking about it a lot. It's been developed to help people who are hard of hearing, but I actually think it would help all of us. And so I keep showing images about how you can see a smile even behind a mask. Finally, try to make memories of laughter. So do an election in your family of what the, funny, the funniest movies are and sit down and make a point of watching those funny movies together. That means that memories of lockdown are imbued with laughter. And if you really want to keep track of how all of this is going, you could make a laughter journal, journal for yourself. And that might be simply something as easy as making a tick every time people have laughed in the household during the day. You could count up how much laughter there is in your house. And all I'm really trying to say with all of that information is that your laughter matters. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it for granted. Value it and see where you can ripple it out, even in the most difficult of circumstances in your household. It will help. Thank you very much. Over to you, Anne. Oh, that was, I don't know how to follow that, actually, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, uh, that was marvellous, and thank you very much. I certainly have a better appreciation of laughter and the bi biology and science behind it, which is great. And I know from looking at the chats that a lot of people were saying there, you know, it makes more sense for them now. And I think that's fantastic. You know, we've had a lot of questions, and what about their anxieties and the things that I was talking about earlier. But what I liked about what we were do, you were doing there was bringing it back to safety and understanding and connection and the building of trust that happens and the playfulness that all needs to be there for a child to feel safe. But actually for the, the adult to feel safe as well, it's really hard for them. Their lives often have changed in the blink of an eye yep. and they don't feel safe they don't and how do you help another person feel safe when you're not feeling safe that, <clears throat> that word safety is really really important when you just think in terms of okay i'm in a saber-toothed tiger state at the moment that means i'm scared my body is scared mm -hmm. how do i get it back to a place of safety because the safety is the place of calm. And you need to go back and forth between the two. The point of life is not to spend all of your time in your teddy bear system. Mm -hmm. But if you can't get back there, that's where the difficulty comes. So whatever you can do to, to help to create a sense of safety matters. And yeah. for kinship families and for children who've experienced trauma, and the truth is that in many kinship families, there may have been quite a number of generations of trauma. Whatever you can do to create safety is even more powerful because very often bodies have become wired for anxiety. And, yes. and laughter is just one way of creating safety and describing it that way stops it from sounding light and frivolous. Laughter is actually incredibly powerful and important as is play. And I, I like the way that you connected it to playfulness because it's, it's, I, there is such an important connection there for us to be playful with our children um, giving them that even a stance how you stand when you're playful you're you're not it's not frightening you don't have a frightening stance so you approach it differently you approach that child in a different way you know, so the smile on your face, it's, it's almost an energy, isn't it, Suzanne? Uh, it's the energy and it's also, there's all these unconscious things going on. So remember I said that babies come into the world already connected yes. and we saw that baby looking up at her mom with that intense gaze. We're picking all of that up unconsciously. So when you're in a playful state, your face looks different. The muscles on your face look different. And if you have become hyper vigilant yeah. to the look of anger or the look of threat. You can read that in other people when they don't even feel it. So your, yeah. your children 
can read, if you're confused, so I can imagine that some faces look like this, trying to work the technology in front of us. Yeah. But yeah. children who have become hyper vigilant to anger read that as you're about to shout at them or you're about to hit yeah. them. So, yes. we, and they're, they're in, you know, that's all um, unconscious. So you don't even oh, know your face no, that way. No, the no. more laughter you have, the more relaxed yeah. your face looks. Yeah. And that's why those tips for how to create laughter, literally don't just wait for the laughter to happen, literally go figure out how to create more of it. Yeah. And, and, and that starts a cycle that helps the yeah. family. And it was interesting, one of the questions here, you know, is um, how can we explain to children in our care without seeming to scare them about anxiety? And I, I, I always feel, and it was what you, um, I think the way you've described anxiety, they were with the saber-toothed tiger and the, the, the teddy bear, I hope maybe we'll help that in that descriptive way. And also, I always believe with children, they take in so much more than we ever think they're understanding yeah, they or know. And that unknown of what it's about is what creates even more fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we sit and talk to them in an age appropriate way that helps them go, all right, that's, that's anxiety and that's why my tummy feels really weird or, or I kind of, I can't kind of catch my breath, whatever it is, you're helping them make sense of what's behind it. Yeah, it's the making sense of it. So when I like that word explain, but it can make it sound like we have to do maybe a really big explanation. Yeah. You know, you can just help them to experience. So let's see, you might say, oh, is your tummy, are you in a saber-toothed tiger state again? Where's that saber-toothed tiger in your body now? Oh, is he in your tummy? What will we do to make him go away? Will we get another glass of water? Will that make the, the saber-toothed tiger go away? Mm -hmm. Now you might say, will we get another bowl of ice cream? Or you might say, will we, get that, will we get that funny movie? Will you go get me a joke? So what you're using that really metaphoric language, you're helping them to understand that it's a saber-toothed tiger who lives in their throat, right? Or the saber-toothed tiger is in their chest. And there, then there are things we can do to make the saber-toothed tiger go away. When the saber-toothed tiger comes, let's breathe out really big. <gasps> We just blow him away. Yeah. And, and so showing them what they can do, modeling it, doing it with them yes, to make the saber tooth tiger go away means that they are not at the mercy of the saber tooth tiger because their body thinks at the extreme and they're going to die because the body is trying to help them to run away from the, from the danger. If we can help to give them ways that get them back into a teddy bear state, they're not at the mercy of their anxiety and then yeah. we're not at the mercy of their anxiety and if you do that a lot when when the anxiety is not very big then you have a ritual going on what do we do when the saber-toothed tiger is in your chest that's right we breathe then and you know what Suzanne the carer is breathing with them absolutely and their anxiety is reducing as well so you're not only modeling but you're actually doing it for yourself too so that they, you're getting and they can see that so they can see you know there are, might be times where they can see um the gran or grandpa really upset or worried or anxious and if they if you do the same things and explain it in the same way they know that therefore that's okay because they were anxious and now they're not exactly isn't that great? Exactly. And, it, and, and I can see coming in here on the chat, someone's just yep. saying, um, okay, I can see that inducing laughter when things are low level, but should we be trying to bring saber tooth tiger moments back to teddy mo moments through laughter, um, even when you want to shout? Yep. Should we be trying to laugh when you want to shout? Yep. Whatever you can do to get closer back to a teddy bear state, even when you're when you're really tense will help. So um, one of our questions says, what do I do when the child won't come to the door and has locked himself in his room and won't come and get meals? Do you know what I would do? And everybody has to make their own 
you are the one in the moment. But if I had a child who was locked behind the door and would not come to meals, I would push it. If they're really behind the door, okay, take the meal to the door because that's a time for building trust. And I'd slip a joke underneath the door along with the meal. I would turn it into a moment of laughter, right? And the, it may not work in the moment, but it lightens it. And, and you have to then go look for a joke, even if you don't feel like it. If you're thinking, okay, Suzanne says, try to bring lightness to this. I will bring a joke. The process of finding the joke helps some of that tension go out of your own body. Yeah. So, I, uh, yeah, I would, I would probably say to people very similarly, but actually probably maybe even that piece of paper, I might sort of say to them, say to them, I can tell you're angry, but I'm here. And I'll be here when you're ready to open the door. Cause, and, and that's really important because it's important not to feel that you're laughed at. Absolutely. Right? So if you, have, if you help a child to feel heard and you yes. help to lighten it, then you're offering both. And, it, and if that becomes the ritual that every time you bring a meal to the door, they get a note that says, I, can, I know you're angry and, not but, and I'll, I'll be here when you want to come and talk. And here's your joke for the morning. It becomes a ritual. And then they start to expect that they're going to get acceptance and lightness, even in a time of tension. And if they are really tense, it's because they can't manage it yet. They're doing their best, but they need our help. They may not even know that you could bring lightness to such a moment. Yeah. So that helps that's... them to know that. Yeah. I, do you know, Suzanne, I would love to go on and on I and know. on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've just been reminded of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Can I add one other thing really quickly? Okay, Anne? really quick, Suzanne. Really quick. Okay, there are several people saying that Scots often use alcohol to yes. let them laugh. Yeah. Um, that's true. We have a, so what that tells us is that we have a culture that has somehow repressed laughter and silliness and that we need alcohol to help us with that. Um, that's, although, that's why I think thinking more about how to have laughter in the moment, and if, if, and if that's hard for you, that's why I was given some tips about how to have more laughter, um, that, that means that we're then not dependent on um, external substances that help us to laugh, but actually they carry other consequences as well. So I think that one of the answers to that is simply to take laughter more seriously as part of human health and happiness. And I, I would just add a tiny wee thing to that and say, I, you know, being that Scott, um, I think <laughs> a lot of us feel um, that we are funnier and more gregarious and more outgoing and just better people to be around. Um, so having, and that's scary to then go yeah. and try it. And we go back to that fear part. So take, take, just take a chance. Exactly. And try it. Try exactly. it. Practice it and Look, just see. What have you got to lose? Trying for more laughter can't hurt anything. Even when you're in the middle of conflict, like a child laughing at you, if, if that is creating conflict and that's a rhythm in your family, trying something new helps. Yeah, so, yeah. I, so I hope that helps. So, so that, thank you so much. A um, pleasure. I just have, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope, I, I know there's a lot of people I've seen Thank you. And, and to be honest, this means so much to, to see that at the side. I have to say, Suzanne, I don't know about you because, you know, at times it, I know you're there, but it feels like I'm just talking to you. But, um, and no, it's lovely. I have to say, it's lovely. Um, but if you want, there will be, this will be recorded and put up on the website. And I know Suzanne will have a recording of it as well. So there'll be places, there'll be resources that will be available. Um, if there's any questions, if there's anything that's touched you, and some of these questions we haven't covered, we would love to, but there is another session, there's two other sessions, so please sign up and register. Um, but if you want, you know, Parent Line, Children First Parent Line is there for you every day. 
and you know we'd love to hear from you with any of these questions yeah um i know i am going on shift so you know if you phone in you might get me um you <laughs> maybe that'll put you off <laughs> sorry <laughs> Um, and we hope to see you again next week, same time, 11 o'clock, Suzanne? 11 o'clock and we're going to be talking about why structure and organization helps also create safety. Uh, go tell lots of people. I look forward to seeing you then. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.